I'm Mia Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over. And Matthew Desmond is someone that we have been yelling about for a very long time. You might remember Evicted was a Discover Award winner for us back in the day. 2016, I was looking this up. I was like, wasn't it? It felt much more recent than that, but no, 2016. And that is the book that Matt won the Pulitzer for. He also is the recipient of a MacArthur Genius Grant. So there's a lot happening here. The new book, which is spectacular, it is tiny and it is fierce and it is everything we need right now in this moment in America, is called Poverty by America. And I am delighted to see you in the studio, your studio, my studio. Yeah. So good to be here. It's such an honor to be in conversation with you, in conversation with folks that love and live by books and ideas. You know, Barnes & Noble was such an ally to Evicted and helped get that book into so many so many hands. And so uh, it's just great to see you again. Great to be in conversation with you as always. Well, I'm always smarter too after I talk to you. <laughs> Even when it's like, you know, these fast publisher lunches that sometimes happen, I'm like, uh-huh, I'm officially smarter after talking to this. And that was even before Evicted hmm. came out. You also run the Eviction Lab at yeah. Princeton University as well as teaching and everything else. So how did you even have the time to write Poverty by America? I know you're always thinking about this stuff, but thinking about it and putting it on paper are two different things. Yeah, I mean, it was, I was convicted, you know, I was convicted. I felt that for my adult life, I've been studying poverty and I've, you know, lived in poor neighborhoods. I've spent time with union reps and organizers and poured over statistical reports. But I was convicted, you know, that this looming question, like, why is there so much poverty in America that I just didn't have a firm grasp on? So this book was a challenge to myself. And kind of, you know, a challenge to say, okay, what's your answer to that question? And what's your answer to how could we finally abolish it? You know, not cut the poverty rate by 10% or nudge it a little bit, but really cut the cancer out. I have the honor of of working with an incredible team uh, here at Princeton at the Eviction Lab. And so we were able to do a lot of policy work uh, during the pandemic with respect to the eviction moratorium, with emergency rental assistance. We're proud of that work, but it was also a time where I felt the writing had a hold of me and I had to kind of answer it. There's a lot of what feels slightly counterintuitive hmm. in this book, and, and you can tell that you're sorting through it as we go through. And some of this material feels like it might have popped in the stuff that you've done for the New York Times Magazine. Yeah, am I right about there's that? There's a little bit that's in there. You yeah. know, there's some reporting that, that I've done with the magazine in there, but there's a lot, a lot of new material in this book. At one point, you're talking about how we can't assume that people are dependent on something like welfare, that in fact, there's much more avoidance of being part of that particular system. And I think there are still a lot of folks out in the world who think, oh, well, I mean, because they've been told this, they've been told this for years and years and years, that people somehow aspire to be on assistance, when in fact, the reality is completely the opposite. Yeah, let's break it down. And so I think that, you know, we still hear a lot about welfare dependence today. And, you know, when welfare dependency was, you know, huge in the public debate in the 80s and 90s, a lot of researchers dig, dug into the data to see um, if they could find evidence for it. And they just really didn't. You know, there, there were some folks that stayed on welfare for years and years, but most people used it when, you know, they were between jobs, after they got a divorce. So it wasn't a, a trap um, as much as a, a something to get folks through a really hard time. But we continue to hear about it today. I mean, remember the pandemic, you know, when mm-hmm. everyone, um, well, not everyone, I, I'm going to say, you know, a lot of people in Congress, and especially right. on the Republican side, mm-hmm. were harping that, you know, the external unemployment benefits were keeping people home. And, you know, frankly, it kind of made sense. You know, uh, we we're, you know, paying folks to not go to work. But it just wasn't true. You know, when in the summer of 2021, 25 states ended, some or all of the emergency benefits, did those states suddenly see their job numbers fly up? They, they didn't, actually. Mm-hmm. So by the end of the summer, the employment rates in those states, the states that had ended the benefits, were the same mm-hmm. as the employment numbers in the, in the states that hadn't. So this really raises the question, why is this such a cliche that we hear over and over? Because I don't think we believe it in our heart of hearts. I do think it's a way that we have been taught, like you said, a a cliche or or something that organizes our thought. But you're right. And, you know, to dig into the data, 
you know, the bigger problem is welfare avoidance. The fact that so many low-income families are not taking advantage of aid that's that's available to them. So let's talk numbers just real quick. Uh, most uh, elderly folks that could receive food stamps do not claim them. About one in five workers that could receive the earned income tax credit, which is a big bump once a year for, for low-income workers, especially parents, one in five of those workers just pass on the earned income tax credit. And if you add that up with folks that pass on social security income and food stamps and unemployment insurance when they're between jobs, you learn that every year, you know, low-income folks are passing on over $140 billion, billion with a B, right. dollars every year. You know, this is not a picture of welfare dependence. You know, this is a picture of, of something else. Part of why I wanted to open with the whole avoidance versus dependence schism, because that's essentially what it is, is the fact that we have made so much progress, material progress, as you refer to it early in the book, houses, cars, cell mm. phones. I mean, cell phones are the best example possible. Right. I mean, quite a number of us walk around with supercomputers in our pockets. Right. And now we're in a place, though, where we're making huge advances as a society and a culture in many ways, and yet poverty is not dropping. That's right. So th I think there's a few things we could we could jump off from that that point. You know, one is some people say, well, gosh, look at all these poor folks that have, have cell phones. Look at all these poor folks that have televisions. D does that mean they're not poor? But you can't eat a cell phone. You can't trade a television in for a living wage or health insurance. And in fact, like as the price of things like toasters and blenders and cell phones have decreased, the price of life's most necessary necessities like fuel and rent have increased. And so it isn't the case that just because folks can be well clothed or have access to a cell phone, which today is just like essential to find like jobs, housing and romantic partners, that doesn't mean those folks aren't really struggling. So I think that that's one point. And then another point that you raise, right, is like, look, look at all the advances we made in the last 50 years. Look at the way that culture and medicine and technology and science have advanced since the Beatles broke up, since we were involved in Vietnam. But the poverty rate has been incredibly stubbornly persistent. And I think it's rather shameful for the richest country in the history of the world. One of the things I th was thinking about as I read the new book was a lot of what I learned in Evicted. And it's simple things like it's really hard to keep your kitchen sink clean when you're broke and your landlord's not fixing something like standing water in your like that's not anything I've ever had to experience. It's It goes back to this idea that there are two Americas, right? Like. At any given moment, any of us is living in two, there are two banking systems, there are right. two housing systems, right. there are two educational, there's, right. they are not equal right. in any way, shape or form. And I think one of the biggest points that you make in this new book is that this system, as broken as it is, as terrible as it is, does benefit some of us. Yeah, it benefits quite a lot of us. And I think that many of us now are familiar with the tale of two cities or the inequality debate has really permeated the American consciousness. But it's not just that some of us have more than others. It's having more than others gives us the impression that the society is, is working because it's working really well for us. You know, if you're a homeowner in America, that's usually a really good deal. You right. know, you get a big tax break. Your mortgage doesn't go up every year. That can increase your wealth. But for a third of the country who are renters, it's incredibly unstable and their life is full of uncertainty and eviction and homelessness often. And I think that the book really tries to make this move, which is, you know, there is so much poverty in America, not in spite of our wealth, but because of it, and really tries to make the argument that inequality isn't just about me having more than you. It's about my gains actually coming at your losses. And what does that mean? For solving poverty in America. And then it really tries to lay out the ways that we rely and benefit on exploitation, exploitation in the, in the labor market and the housing market and the financial market. I mean, the financial market is insane. I mean, every day there's like $61 million pulled out of the pockets of low-income families in terms of overdraft fees or payday loan fees. And like, you know, when James Baldwin 
remark that it's so expensive to be poor. There's no, it's like, how could he even imagine what we've become on that score? So how do I benefit from that? Well, I get a free checking account, right? And maybe if I'm invested in one of these big banks, you know, my investment portfolio looks good. So one of the things that the book is trying to do, and there's many other examples, right, is just try to get us to kind of see and realize how our lives are are intimately connected with the lives of the poor, and then make a case for how we can unwind it, how we can divest from, from poverty in our own lives. What was the biggest surprise for you? I mean, was there something in your daily life where you're like, I can't even believe I was doing that? There's That stuff comes up a lot, I think. And I think that it does raise questions about, are we doing enough with respect to how we shop, uh, how our savings account? Should we should we turn to that? And so I, I think that those are, are wonderfully motivating questions for me. I also think I just learned a ton researching this book. I mean, one of the things that blew me away was studying the American welfare state, right? And so for me, the American welfare state means things like food stamps, like housing assistance, but it also means things like a 529 plan. And it means things like a mortgage interest deduction. You know, every year we spend about $150 billion on homeowner subsidies and about $50 billion on direct housing assistance to the needy. Our welfare state is lopsided. Now, many of us kind of don't see tax breaks as something that's akin to a government check, but both a tax break and a check increases the deficit, cost the country something, and both of them put money in your pocket. So if you're a homeowner and you get the mortgage interest deduction, we could deliver that through a tax break, or we could just mail you a check every every uh, month. And then instead of mailing the poor check, we can reduce their taxes, for example. It's the same difference. So if you really look at the full nature of the welfare state, you learn just how utterly lopsided it is and how we've chosen the subsidization of affluence over the alleviation of poverty. So here's the stat that really killed me. Every year in America, the top 20% of income earners, they take home about $35,000 in government benefits. The bottom 20% of income earners, our poorest neighbors, they took they take home about $25,000. That's 40% less. So we really are giving more to families that really need it the least. You know, going back to what you said about Baldwin, right, and that it's so expensive to be poor, mm-hmm. I think one of the points that you make that really surprised me, not in what you said, but because I needed to see it in print in front mm-hmm. of me, is the fact that poverty is more about a lack of choices right. than it is about people making not great like you just don't have options right and again it goes back to the three things you were talking about financial you know educational social housing all of it but how do we start to address this i mean you've laid it out a little bit up to this point in this conversation but how do we even start to give people more choice because choice is a word that folks love to latch on to and it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. I think just a, adapting that perspective is fundamental to how we get out of this mess. So mm-hmm. that does mean that we don't just want more policies or mm-hmm. deeper investments. We want different policies. We want policies that stop accommodating poverty. Mm-hmm. We need moves that disrupt poverty, that really cut it at its root. And so You know, exploitation is a pretty charged word, Mm -hmm. but it just basically means, you know, when you're over a barrel, you know, people have have you at their mercy. And so the antidote for exploitation is choice. Mm -hmm. If we expand the choice for all Americans, I think that really thwarts uh, exploitative ways. So let's just take housing, for example. So, you know, if you're a low-income family, you basically have one choice when it comes to housing. You know, you have to live in the private rental market. And if you're below the poverty line, chances are you're spending at least 50% of your income on housing costs. You know, the lines for public housing today are now counted in years, they're counted in decades. We just don't have enough of that investment to go around. And then low-income families are also shut out of the mortgage market, not because they can't afford mortgages. And so One of the uh, folks I write about in the book is Lakia Higsby, Mm -hmm. who was, you know, living in a four bedroom home in in Cleveland. She was paying $950 a month in rent. But 
if Lakia bought that home under conventional mortgage standards, she'd be paying like $570 a month mm-hmm. in rent. Mm-hmm. That's like $4,500 a year more in her pocket. Significant. Right. Why isn't that option available? It's because banks and lending institutions really aren't interested in funding the kind of homes that Lakia and low-income families could afford. And it's because you could just make a lot more money, you know, with a mortgage Mm -hmm. for a million bucks than a mortgage for $75,000, for example. There's plenty of those homes that go around. You know, last year, 27% of homes in America that were sold were first sold for less than $100,000. But only 23% of those were financed with a mortgage. This is one way we can increase the choice for families like Lakia. We could say, let's make it attractive for banks to finance small dollar mortgages so more and more working families can actually have a home that they own. So this is just one of like several ideas that can come out of this choice framework. Choice framework in the labor market doesn't mean we just need to kind of start adding on like these wage bonuses like we do now with the earning them tax credit. It Mm -hmm. also means we need to invest in worker power. We need to make labor organizing easy. We need to establish a minimum wage that is automatic and Mm -hmm. doesn't just happen when Congress kind of gets around to it every decade or so, which is just unthinkable. And so I think that, you know, empowering the poor and expanding their choice is a fundamental requirement for ending poverty in America. Because we spend quite a lot of time, and I say we as a culture and a society, because I think people slip into this very easily, we spend a lot of time policing the poor and decisions that get made simply because you don't have a lot of options. And it's one of those things where disruption was an interesting word choice, I thought, when I came across it in in Poverty by America. Disruption, you know, is a word that's been so co-opted by Silicon Valley, (laughs) Mm. and not necessarily always for things that need to be disrupted. Driving a taxi in New York used to be a really great way to make a living for new arrivals to the city and longtime New Yorkers and whatnot. And now the industry is just completely in shambles because it was, quote unquote, disrupted. And maybe I shouldn't be picking on services, but it does this transition to a gig economy doesn't seem to be helping a majority of folks move in a way that other policies in the past have been able to help them move, say, into the middle class or into the upper middle class, for instance. We've automated so much instead of investing in people. Right. And the way we often talk about the rise of the gig economy is in this kind of inevitability language, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, it's, you know, the technology came and then golly gee, you know, we we see this hurting the poor. Mm-hmm. But the gig economy in America is not like the gig economy in other places, right? right? So you could have heavier regulations on ride-sharing apps. You could mm-hmm. make sure that people in the gig economy are protected under labor laws or minimum wage laws, which they currently aren't in the United States. So this like language of inevitability and automation mm-hmm. and the forward march of capitalism or progress, these are policy decisions. One of my favorite historical examples is the tractor, you know, and we have this kind of vision in our head that the tractor was disruptive technology. The tractor of the grapes of wrath was the thing that put all these sharecroppers out of business, but it wasn't. It was like the tractor came along during a time where we closed our borders to immigration flows. So there was this massive labor shortage in the fields, and that's when the tractor started putting folks out of business. So it wasn't just the technology was disruptive. There was a policy decision. The United States closed its borders, and that's where the the pain really came. So things that we talk about that are often talked about like innocently or like a byproduct of history, like deindustrialization or Mm -hmm. automation, these are things that we've decided to do, moral decisions we've decided as as a country. Yeah, you talk about our morally fraught systems. I mean, one of the things I appreciate about reading you is that even though I know that brain is working 24 seven to parse every word, you know how to write and you know how to tell a story. And I'm not a policy wonk. I'm a bookseller. And yet I cannot put your books down because you know how to structure sentences. You know how to tell a story. I want to slip away from policy for just a second though and Mm -hmm. talk about Matt Desmond as the writer, because clearly Mm -hmm. you put a lot of thought 
into all of this. Mm -hmm. So when you're sitting down to draft, where are you starting with a book like this? Well, I really believe in and have the privilege of uh, writing in community. And so, you know, I have an incredible editor, Amanda Cook at Crown. And, um, you know, she said, you know, we want this book to feel like you and I are talking at a bar. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was kind of the idea to try to convey all this information, but in a way that's accessible, in a way that's that's not defensive, in a way that's ambitious, but um, and is trying to speak to a lot of folks. And so I think that, you know, writing with her and community with her is important. And then the book went through a few big workshops where I mm-hmm. invited my colleagues in uh, the social sciences, but also writers that I admire and mm-hmm. that have taught me things to, to read early drafts of the book and just give it to me. Folks like Kyungi Yamada Taylor were there. Yeah. My colleague, uh, Kathy Eden from Princeton was there. Mm-hmm. Um, Luke Schaefer, they, they wrote $2 a day. Jason DePaul from The Times, Sarah Stillman, uh, Tressie Cotton. So just the incredible minds that gave me so much to think about, so much great hard feedback, hard mm-hmm. words. And so there was a part of me that that wrote, wrote this book in conversation with, with them and in conversation with folks that I have met along the way, too. I mm-hmm. write, for example, about my friend Wu in yeah. in um, Milwaukee, who was my roommate when I lived in Milwaukee. And I, I write about his struggles with, with diabetes and a, and a mm-hmm. leg amputation. And when I'm writing about Wu, I'm writing about my friend and right. someone that I, I want to be proud of this book and proud of his story in it. So I think writing for all those different audiences was important to me. I think for me, just as a writing process, I outline the heck out of my books. I, the outline for me takes about 75% of the time and the writing 25%. Mm-hmm. And I just want to allow myself to flow once I have it. So there was just a lot of, there was a lot of reading, a lot of research, and then a lot of like that discernment process where you're trying to figure out what the, of all this stuff, what is the kernel uh, that you want to convey in this, this little paragraph? I also have to say, since we're talking about writing a little bit, like the the part where I struggle with is this kind of more essayistic part where you're kind of outside of the facts, you know, and you you go beyond it. And that, I think that's a part of, I wanted the the book to have a a moral force. I'm a preacher's kid and I wanted, you know, there's some parts of the book where it's me as a social scientist, but there's Mm -hmm. other parts where it's me as a a preacher, I guess, or someone that's, that's trying to make an argument on moral grounds. And I think for me, that's, I'm much more comfortable in the terrain of, I saw this, here's mm-hmm. what I saw, or this is what the data showed and in the terrain of, should we do this? But I think the book really pushed me to, to exercise that muscle. Yeah, I've seen you do events on stage in our stores. And <laughs> I'm just thinking back to a moment, there was an event in New York and you were asked a very pointed question by someone who clearly owns property and rents it out yeah. in New York. And you just closed your eyes and this wall of statistics, very politely, but you did that thing, and and I was watching the person's response because I can do these things, and it was fascinating. It was really fascinating to see the exchange, and it was just simply, it was data, and right. that is exactly what that person had asked you for was, show us the proof, and <laughs> all of a sudden that supercomputer went. <laughs> it was great. I remember that. I remember that exchange, and uh, I love those exchanges. Mm-hmm, you know, yeah. um, I learned so much from those exchanges. Mm-hmm, I, I really mm-hmm. learn when audience members push me and challenge me and and criticize me. But I do think part of my job is to be an ambassador for the social sciences to really Absolutely. say, you know, we don't need to do guesswork on this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, that last the last two lines of the book, right, are like, we don't need to yeah. outsmart this problem. We need to out hate it. Mm-hmm. And I think that part of that, I hope I earn those sentences by saying you know, this is what we really know uh, works and what we know doesn't work. And so things like welfare dependency, that's actually Mm -hmm. an empirical question. We can get to the Mm -hmm. bottom of that. We can get to the bottom of if you increase the minimum wage, do people lose their jobs? We can get to the bottom of that. And Mm -hmm. so I think that there is a, you know, at the end of the day, there is a part of me that just loves and feels part of the tribe of social scientists Mm -hmm. trying to bring data to bear on the morally urgent questions of our day. And I love the idea that we're framing this as morally urgent. I think so much of the conversation has been co-opted by folks who have decided that they are the only arbiters of morality. And I think all of this is urgent. All of this is pressing. Time is speeding up and change has sped up quite a lot too. And we've got to figure this out. I mean, climate change is also 
a form of economic injustice mm -hmm. for a lot of communities. And we're not connecting the dots as quickly as perhaps we could be, especially when you think about how fast information flows now in a way that it didn't previously. So the idea that we can lean into this data, I think, is hugely important, but you always have the human piece yeah. too. I think that's that's so crucial. I also think like, you know, you, you spoke about a moment and I feel like we are as a country in a moment that it is really a pregnant with potential when it comes to economic justice. I right. feel like that old Gramsci line where the old is dying and the new hasn't yet been born is just so relevant to this moment right now. Most Democrats and most Republicans believe that poverty is a result of unfair circumstances. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the old, tired cliches about poverty, they are dying. They're alive in Washington. A lot of our electeds keep repeating them, but the American mm -hmm. people have moved past them. Mm -hmm. And I think that we are searching for and striving for a, a better way. And we can feel it. We can feel this emotional violence we do to each other because we tolerate so much poverty in this land of dollars. I think that the country is, is eager and hungry to have this debate, and I hope this book contributes to that a little bit. You know, there are a couple of different points, though, where you say, in slightly different ways, we can't just spend our way out of this. Right. That we have to consider, and, and you're not, we aren't actually arguing that we should just throw money at the problem. We have to be smarter about where we use resources. And also some of the lowest hanging fruit is just getting people to use what is legitimately right. theirs. I mean, right. I think there was a moment for social security and an elderly community where just suddenly the instructions were explained to them and enrollment went up 30% and the community was much more, I think this was Milwaukee. If folks aren't accessing the resources they need and deserve, why mm -hmm. is that? Right. And for a while we thought it might be stigma. You know, right. maybe folks are embarrassed. And I don't know if you remember this, but like food stamps used to be stamps, right? And you'd have right. to like do this degradation ritual at the grocery store and like hand your stamps. And so we, we changed that. Now a food stamp comes at an EBT card. It looks like a visa or anything else. It's, it's very sly. When we switched from stamps to EBT card, did we see take up rates for food stamps just jump up? Right. Uh, no, we did not. It right. turns out there weren't a lot of families saying, okay, I'll, you know, now I'll, I'll use this benefit. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, stigma is there. Stigma is an important part of the story. But it seems like the, the thing that's, that's really driving it is we've made it hard and confusing to access mm -hmm. these benefits. And so a little does go a long way here. Changing the font, making things easy, mm -hmm. connecting, you know, um, folks with a, you know, a coach that can walk them through how to connect. These things actually really matter for getting, for getting families the aid they need. I do think this is the low-hanging fruit. And you know what? This is the United States of America. Mm -hmm. We are the global leaders at mm -hmm. marketing, advertising, right. you know, convincing you that you need this brand of potato chips, not that brand of potato chips. And we should apply that same level of ingenuity and creativity and like tirelessness to making sure low-income families get connected with resources that ease their hardships. So we're talking about reaching out to people. We're talking about the human connection. I mean, mm. all of this argument for so long has been framed in these black and white terms of X amount of dollars. Yeah, yeah. And then in some cases that we just send these block grants to states and states obviously choose how to use them and some do interesting things and some do things that made my head explode. But <laughs> right. folks can see all of that. They can experience all of that in the book. But then honestly, it seems like we just keep repeating ourselves. One of the arguments that the book is making, right, mm -hmm. is like the end of poverty isn't something out there. You know, it's not just something that Congress should address. Mm -hmm. It's something that you, I, and everyone should address by really searching ourselves and figuring out how we're connected to the problem and how we're connected to the solution. So one of the arguments that the book makes is one of the reasons that poverty persists is because we've created these exclusive wealthy communities. You know, in, right. on most American land, you can only build a single family home. And there are these pockets of incredible affluence and public safety in America. But those pockets create a poverty traps, you know, mm -hmm. and force low income families to live in areas of, of concentrated despair mm -hmm. and, and misery. 
So what can we do personally to address that? You know, we can we can make sure that we are building inclusive communities. We can show up to those Tuesday night zoning board meetings right. and say, no, 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 you're going to build it. I want mm-hmm. you to build it. I want to live in a community that's inclusive. I mean, what are we like? What are we teaching our kids when we bar other kids from the opportunities our children benefit from, and then do it in their name? You know, what are we doing? And so I think that. I think one of the things that we need to do to move forward is to start taking responsibility for this problem uh, in our own lives. I mean, New Jersey has actually passed some of the most progressive housing legislation in the country, not always without a fight, but I didn't realize New Jersey was sort of spearheading this moment. Yeah, New Jersey, the best state, also has, you know, the most aggressive laws when it comes to inclusionary zoning. Mm -hmm. So exclusionary zoning is really kind of the normal law of the land. You know, it says it is illegal in this community to build multifamily housing, affordable housing. Inclusionary zone is the opposite. You know, it says it's illegal not to. New Jersey has a statute called the Mount Laurel Statute. It goes back to a Supreme Court case in the state where it requires every jurisdiction to do its fair share of affordable housing, that fair share being like a, you know, a calculation based on how many people live here, how many jobs are here. And as a result, you know, most suburban jurisdictions in New Jersey have some form of affordable housing in them. And you're right, it it is a fight. If you've ever seen footage on Twitter or on the news about zoning board meetings, they Mm -hmm. are, they can be violent and aggressive. Mm -hmm. And they're violent, aggressive in blue states and in red states, Mm -hmm. uh, too. But New Jersey has made this incredible step forward. And what it means is it's one of the most economically inclusive states in the country. What's its property values? That's one of the highest in the country. How's its public school system doing? It's number one in the country. Mm -hmm. So we can do this without having a hit on our property values. We can do this without having a hit on our public education. But we do need to stop embracing segregationist tendencies. And the excuses that lot of us make to uphold segregation in our communities. They're the same that, you know, folks made in the 60s and the 50s and the 40s. So I do think we need to stand up and, and say this ends with us. It's a point that you make where you're asking if we're accepting broken systems and we're, you know, accepting how we live now simply because it's easy. Because some of us are still comfortable. I mean, you are asking very hard questions, I think, that some people are not going to want to answer. Others might be surprised by their own answers, and other people might just be nodding along going, uh-huh, yeah, of course, of course. Did you walk in with those questions? Did you walk in saying, are we just accepting this because it's easy, or you know, we believe we deserve an upper-class welfare state, or are these the questions that hit you as you were working on the new book? Right. I was open to a lot of possibilities and Mm -hmm. I kind of went where the data, where the argument led me. And, you know, on the one hand, I feel like this is a true story that had to be told, you know, and some people will wrestle with the story. Some people will, will debate it, pick at it. Some people will just sit with the implications of it, whatever your reaction to it. I feel like we had to have a story about the reason we are so poor as a rich country, the reason that Mm -hmm. a third of us live under $50,000 a year. The reason that like one in nine of us can't afford basic necessities. Like if the Mm -hmm. poor founded a country in America, that country would be like Australia. You know, like we have so much more poverty than other rich nations. And the reason is because some lives are made small so others may grow. What people do with that fact, I think is up to them. And I think some people will sit with it, struggle with it. I think some people might be motivated to join all these amazing, incredible, energetic, anti-poverty movements. And some folks might take other steps forward. But I think Mm -hmm. that it is true that like getting a fat tax break is is frankly great, right? Mm -hmm. It's nice to have if you Mm -hmm. can get it. If you can afford to squirrel away money so you're like in a 529 Mm -hmm. plan Mm -hmm. so your kid can go to college, that's frankly nice, right? And I think that we just have to confront that and look at that. And I think the book is at once asking us to consider scaling back a little bit so that more of us Mm -hmm. can enjoy the bounty and the abundance in this country. But it also makes a case that that inclusion of the poor into the union is to the benefit of the union as a whole. And I think that clearly ending poverty 
would be a life altering. It's hard to put into words what this would mean for the mm-hmm. thousands and millions of parents and workers and children below the poverty line. But all of us are drugged down by poverty in our midst. All of us have to confront poverty on our way to work, in our worries about our children, you know, in our threats about am I one divorce or one car accident away mm-hmm. from falling all the way down. And so I think an America that is prosperous without poverty would just carry a different kind of freedom. A lot of us don't have access to because the freedom that we kind of enjoy if we're privileged enough to it is kind of a rich person's freedom, you know, the freedom to barricade ourselves. And I think a freedom of shared prosperity and abundance, I just, I want to live in that country, you know? And so I do think that there's an argument about sacrifice, but -hmm. that sacrifice isn't uh, coming with, with just that. Look, I mean, this is the price of our restored humanity in a way. Yeah, you have a really great line. Our vulnerability to ex- exploitation grows as our liberty shrinks. And it's true. I think we all sort of end up in a corner in a lot of ways, the way the system is designed now. What does an investment in ending poverty look like? I mean, we've talked about the low hanging fruit, we've talked about the human element. And I'm not asking for, you know, a pure policy statement or anything like that, but where do we start? Because that seems to be a big sticking point for a lot of us is, oh, the problem is so overwhelming. It's so massive. We just, where do we even begin? And I don't think that's necessarily the way to approach it. I think the problem is enormous and Mm -hmm. hard and completely Mm -hmm. within our power. One of the things that I did in the book and um, is just to calculate really roughly, just a rough calculus of if you lifted everyone below the poverty line to the poverty line, you know, some people are a hundred dollars below the poverty line. Some people Mm -hmm. are thousands and thousands of dollars below the Mm -hmm. poverty line. If you just added all that up and you lifted everyone to the line, Mm -hmm. uh, how much would that cost us? So that would cost us $177 billion a -hmm. year on top of what we're already spending. Rough calculation, super rough, but it's a good place to start because that number, although sounds enormous and in a way is enormous, that's less than 1% of our GDP. You know, by some estimates, we throw away more in food every year than that amount. So how would we get that money? How would we get that money? And the book suggests that we should start with the cheaters. You know, a study published recently suggested that at the top 1% of our taxpayers just pay the taxes they owed, Mm -hmm. not paid more taxes, not had an increased rate, just under the current regime, paid what they owed, Mm -hmm. that would raise about $175 billion a year. We could just about fill the poverty gap Mm -hmm. if the richest among us just paid what they owed. So on the one hand, yeah, there there are challenges. But on the other hand, when when I do a calculation like that, I feel that it's just completely within our grasp. Yeah. And just to give people a little bit of context, what's the current line that denotes poverty? What's the financial number? Yeah. So officially, uh, the thresholds are about uh, $13,500 for a family of one, one single mm-hmm. person. Right. And for a family of four, it's about $27,000. So about one in nine of us uh, struggle under those conditions uh, every year in America. One of the examples, one of the folks we meet in the new book, too, and I feel like maybe... I've been sitting with a lot of your work for the last couple of weeks. He might also be in one of the Times Magazine pieces, but he's a fast food worker in San Jose, and he had three jobs at one point. And his little brother said to him, how much do I have to pay you an hour so that you can not go to work and you can stay with me for a minute? The mayor of San Jose raised the minimum wage, and he was able to scale back the amount of hours he was working. And he just said to you, my life, is so much better. I feel a little safer and I feel like I can participate. Yeah. And that, I mean, you can't dismiss the story like that. You just can't. There's too much there. And that's one man. Right. And so Julio, you know, he was just working nonstop. His life Mm -hmm. was work and sleep. He worked himself in into the hospital, really. Mm -hmm. You know, when he was 24, he collapsed out of exhaustion in the supermarket. Mm -hmm. 
I think his story really raises the question for us, you know, what do we deny people like Julio when take poverty wages, when we right. underpay them right. for, for their work? And what we deny them is, is life itself, really. I mean, mm-hmm. we deny them happiness and health and family. Uh, and we don't have to, you know, I mean, his job did not have to pay him low wages. And it seems like today there's defenders of the status quo or defenders of capitalism, even that Mm -hmm. might say, Mm -hmm. look, you know, this is just a byproduct of capitalism. There's going to be some jobs that are really low pay. And like the early defenders of capitalism, they would have been shocked and scandalized and frankly embarrassed Mm -hmm. by that argument. You know, they thought capitalism was freedom from poverty. You know, their capitalism was about lifting other folks up. And if you go to Denmark and other capitalist Mm -hmm. countries, right, the folks at McDonald's are making two to three times what our folks are. This is not the capitalism Julio deserves. This is not the capitalism Mm -hmm. we deserve. What does a post-poverty world look like? So I think that a post-poverty world for the poor means that your life is no longer defined just by survival. It means that you can breathe. It means that you can dream a little bit. It means that your kids are confronting safer streets because a country that shares its wealth is a safer country. It means that the scientists and the poets and the artists and the diplomats that we currently deny and waste and lose because we tolerate so much of their poverty become diplomats and scientists and inventors. I think that it means a whole different existence for the poor. For those of us that aren't poor, it means you open the newspaper in the morning and you're not hit with story after story about food lines that are stretching for miles in Houston or skyrocketing eviction mm-hmm. rates or crime rates that are out of control. You feel safer. You go to work, you get on the subway, you get on the bus and you don't scroll past, you know, sprawling tinted comments. You don't see these exhausted faces on the bus. You're not one of those faces. You go out to eat and you don't feel icky. If you're a parent, you don't worry about uh, your kid's future. You know, Mm -hmm. some kids might have a lot more than others, but they're not going to hit this deep bottom layer that we currently tolerate. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a freer country. And I think that's a benefit to all of us. And sometimes when these conversations are had, it's it's almost like um, people imagine a a post-poverty in America as something that's un-American, right? That's something that's anti-us. And I think this is about us really coming into our full selves as a country. Like Mm -hmm. you can still have fancy designer bags, you know, in post-poverty in America, Disneyland would still exist. Inequalities would still Mm -hmm. exist, you know, but I just, I think that, I think that it would be a country that is just a lot more free. Yeah. I got to ask though, when you say less American, are we talking meritocracy? What are we talking about when you say un-American? Because you, there are a couple of people who have had feelings, which you point out in the book. They're just, you know, you were, you delivered a paper years ago at Harvard and someone raised an eyebrow and said, yeah, mm-hmm. my, but let's, let's, before I let you go, let's just jump there for a second. Well, in the, on the one hand, the kind of economic injustice that America mm-hmm. has tolerated and cultivated over the years is quite American, right? right. We have to own that. You know, yep. there are these policy dis decisions we've made, there's moral decisions we've made as a country to to sell out the poor. But the country has also been a country committed to freedom. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Roosevelt was right, you know, necessitous men are not free men. And I think that if we are obsessively committed to freedom, we have to be obsessively committed to the end of poverty. And I think that that will bring about challenges that will bring about problems, you know, it's, you know, this is not an everybody wins book, right? Right. I think that that, that doesn't uh, ring, ring true to me. Mm -hmm. But I do think what we get is going to be much better than what we have to give up on the score. Yeah. And I'm also going to point out too, that it's what 190, it's less than 200. The text itself is less than 200 pages in Poverty by America. I have destroyed my galley too, which it's okay. So it's 189, but your argument is 189 pages. Yep. And then your notes are a good third on top of that. So yeah, if yeah. folks are looking for the homework, the homework has been done and it is documented at the end. And I will say, I mean, I, I'm not kidding when I destroy, mm. you know, I trust <laughs> your notes. I didn't really have to dig through the notes. 
But at the same time, there's so much rich argument and story. And I just, I'm really hoping people come to Poverty by America with an open heart and an open mind. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff that you do here. There are also some very funny lines that are intentionally funny, but I'm not going to quote them only because they made me bark out. <laughs> and um, <laughs> you might have an idea of a couple of them, but uh, critical intelligence being one of them. It's a fun, it, this is going to sound a little weird. It's a fun book to read because it's so mm. open-minded and this and the pacing is great and you know how to move your argument forward mm. and i really appreciate that because it would be very easy i think for you to write a very wonky book you know this might sound weird but i see myself as a writer mm -hmm. and you know you know after evicted came out you know there was a time where i saw myself as a as a policy wonk you know there's mm -hmm. a time i saw myself as a, as a straight social scientist and and i think that i I'm trying to embrace um, my identity as a writer, which means that it has to be told in a way that that's accessible. It's like what Jane Addams said, you know, people want wicked problems simply told. And mm -hmm. I think I try to live up to, to her edict. Yeah, you totally do. And you are really a writer. That's all it comes down to. But I just wanted you to send, uh, say it so we could end the show on that note. <laughs> okay. I may be a bookseller, but I know where I want the story to go in an interview. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Matthew Desmond, thank you so much for joining us on Poured Over. Poverty by America is out now, evicted, obviously, in paperback everywhere in Barnes & Noble. And also, you have a chapter in the 1619 Project on capitalism, so I'm going to use this opportunity to shout that out as well, because it's a pretty mm. great chapter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miwa. So great to see you. Thank you so much. Hello, readers. It's time for another TBR Top Off. We're going to recommend a couple of great books to pick up when you stop in for your copy of Poverty by America by Matthew Desmond. I'm Mark at my Barnes & Noble store in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I've got two fantastic booksellers who will recommend books today. Madison, Jamie, take it away. Hi, I'm Madison coming to you from Los Angeles. You can follow my store at Be in Events Grove. And today when I was thinking of a book to recommend for Poverty by America, I chose The Glass Castle by Jeanette Walls. I think this is a beautiful memoir about how someone can still love their family so much, even if at the core that family was very, very dysfunctional. So in The Glass Castle, Jeanette talks about how her father, who, when he wasn't drinking, was so passionate about teaching them and teaching them physics and geology and just a bunch of things about life. Like he was so like there and in the moment, but then when he was drinking, he was so dishonest and kind of destructive. And then you look at their mother, who was more of a free spirit. She didn't really have any desire to have her main focus be the family. So you just get to read how Jeanette grew up this way, how she kind of had to fend for herself in this living situation. What I love about this book is that the way she writes it kind of changes. So when you're with her as a little girl, you kind of see this family through kind of like rose tinted glasses almost. And then as the book progresses, you kind of see like more about how she started to see the reality of her situation, which I think is such a magnetic and magical way to tell the story. Because if you think back to your own childhood to like now you realize things as, as a grown up that you're like, oh, maybe this wasn't exactly like normal or okay to be raised that way but it's like how I was and you kind of just have to sometimes accept that so for me I think this is a very powerful novel especially as someone who like grew up in a divorced family and I think unfortunately that's kind of more of a normal thing now in America is being raised by two parents and those parents being like in a separate household so kind of that dysfunctionality I see in this book kind of resonates with me personally, which is why I think it can resonate with a lot of people. And I think she's such a powerful storyteller. We can all agree her parents were kind of awful. They were awful, but she still has, like you can tell in her writing, she still loves them. They're her, like, they're her parents. So like, even though like they were awful, how she grew up was not like rainbows and butterflies at like, she still loves her family. And I think that's really important. And it comes across in this novel which is why I wanted to recommend this book because I think it pairs well 
just to see kind of like dysfunctional units. And you still see like children coming out on top of that. So like, even if you have a background or you grew up in a home that was kind of more, maybe what people would categorize as this dysfunctional, like there's still so much hope that you can grow from it and kind of like not necessarily grow out of it, but as a person, you grow from these experience and you can come out as a wonderful, beautiful human. So that was The Glass Castle by Jeanette Walls. What do you got for us, Jamie? <laughs> that is such a great book too, Madison. That is a customer favorite for a reason. Mm-hmm. I'm Jamie. I'm in Leewood, Kansas. Uh, you can follow my store on at BN Leewood KS. And I um, was thinking about Poverty by America and how much there was to absorb in that book. And um, of course, I think the really heartbreaking parts, kind of speaking to your choice, Madison, are about how our systems fail these families and fail to provide meaningful assistance to poor people. Unfortunately, there are a lot of stories to choose from, right? So I'm just going to reach back a couple of years um, and recommend Andrea Ellett's Pulitzer Prize winning book, Invisible Child. Poverty, Survival, and Hope in an American City. It follows eight years in the life of a young girl, uh, Dasani Coates is her name, who is living in poverty in New York City with her parents and her seven siblings. This is also a tough read. Uh, Dasani's parents are raising their family like right on the edge. They struggle with drug addiction, with homelessness, and raise their eight children with income from a mix of crime and public assistance. And Dasani is this kind and curious and imaginative girl who loves her family and who feels a huge responsibility for her younger siblings. So when she's able to attend boarding school as part of a special program, it becomes clear that she's going to carry the weight of this family around with her forever. Um, And some of the most frustrating moments in this really, really well-researched story come when the family is trying to get help. The systems seem designed to fail them. They have to navigate all of these crazy regulations, and no one seems able to really help them within those structures. So, for example, um, if the children are split up and placed into foster care, then the government will spend about $30,000 a month on their care. But if they stay solely in the custody of their father when their mother loses custody, um, he can't even get any approval for food stamps because they're technically in his wife's name. And so he can't feed his children because of these seemingly arbitrary rules. Um, And that's just one example of many spectacular ways that we've failed to really help families like this. Over the eight years covered in the book, there are many, many more examples and The author traces a kind of through line um, all the way through the family's history of suffering, of uh, racism, poverty, and not being able to break free from that poverty cycle. Um, So when Dasani gets this opportunity, which on its face seems like just the thing they need to break free, um, she is tugged back to care for her family and her younger siblings in particular. So the dilemma is moving. Their story is moving. It is overwhelming. Um, At turns, I think it's tender and infuriating, and it just takes these broken systems that you read about in um, the Matthew Desmond book and puts a face on them, uh, a lot like The Glass Castle. Uh, It's a great read, and in addition to winning the Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction, it was a favorite book pick of President Obama's just a couple of years ago. And a customer favorite as well. Fantastic picks as usual. That was The Glass Castle and Invisible Child. Thank you both so much for your recs. As always, you've got great taste in books. But that's all we have for today. Thank you so much for tuning in to Poured Over. Please make sure to give us a rating and subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow us on our socials at Barnes & Noble. Pretty simple. Thanks so much for tuning in, everybody. Have a great day and happy reading. Bye. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.